so this part of the podcast, if you've not seen Jay and Silent Bob reboot, um, and you care about having the plot or events spoiled, um, A, if you've seen the first five or six Kevin Smith movies, there's not a whole lot to spoil, but for the sake of those who want to go in completely fresh, uh, this half of the episode, I believe we, or, or maybe we might make this a separate episode, we're going to, um, we're going to do an in-depth conversation with spoilers. Okay. Um... Result. All right, it's spoiler time. Spoiler time. We need a we need the spoiler theme song. <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to compose a spoiler theme song. Uh, although no, we'd be just be playing it every time. Maybe you, we need you, a you theme can song. smell it from here. Something spoiled. Um. <laughs> Um, um, maybe, maybe we need, instead of, instead of the music, we need to have, uh, an actual song that's all about, uh, a theme song for the show that's actually just, we're spoiling a movie, we're spoiling another movie, let's listen to spoilers as we spoil another movie. Mm. Okay, but, you know, not that. <laughs> we're, we're just, yeah, we're, we're shitting on your hopes of any kind of virgin experience with media. Um... <laughs> Um, um, yeah, so Jay and Silent Bob reboot, uh, the spoiler edition. Yeah, so I, I thought we could start by talking about, um, I didn't think the last third of the movie was terrible. You seemed, I, you I seemed think, less plussed. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if, um, I was thinking it, 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 it seemed to go off the rails, but it wasn't that it went off the rails, it was just that it kind of went nowhere and, <laughs> and didn't make didn't make it much sense was just thrown in there because like well we need to have something happen that needs to kind of reference the uh uh the first movie but uh i don't know what it's going to be so okay let's have it be this thing maybe that is going off the rails i don't mm. know oh should we should we provide a more um in-depth uh, synopsis of the movie because we avoided that oh yeah yeah okay thing. yeah let's uh so for our listeners that listen for our in-depth plot synopses which apparently there's at least one yeah yeah um yeah, so I, so movie opens. Jay and Silent Bob have secret weed growing operation hidden inside of a fake uh, Chick Fil A knockoff called Cock Smokers. Um, the FBI comes. They get sent to court. They sign away the rights to their names, and they uh, they find then, out. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. And then, and then they yeah they they find out that they did that. They find out that there's um there's a new movie version, a reboot of Blunt Man. And Chronic, well, which is based on Jay and Silent Bob, right? Right. The the actual Jay and Silent Bob were still fictional, right? Um, so when Jay and Silent Bob strike back, they find out that there's a Blunt Man and Chronic movie being made, so they go to Hollywood in order to stop the movie from being made. So now they find out that there's a reboot of Jay and Silent Bob. Uh, of, of, there's a reboot of Blunt Man and Chronic called Blunt Man v Chronic, mm -hmm. um, in which uh, Blunt Man, the Jason Mewes character, is is now female um, in th instead of instead of male. Mm -hmm. um, but so they go to Hollywood to stop that from being made, and in the process they they, they had signed away the right they they were duped into signing away the rights. Uh, not not to the characters, um, but to their own names. So they can no longer go by the names Jay and Silent Bob. So they come up with with different fake names uh, throughout the movie. All right. Um, when when and, they need names, and then they embark on a cross country road trip. They um they meet Jay's um. Jay Jay's finds like, out that he has a daughter, basically, who is actually Kevin Smith's daughter, like real life daughter. Right. It's played. Yeah. It's played by uh, Harley Quinn Smith. Um, and she, I thought she turned in a great performance in the movie. Like with the with the material she was given, like she hit all the beats just right. I, I thought she did a great job, honestly. Um, oh, and um, the the daughter. Um, well, yeah, Jay finds out that he has a daughter. The daughter, um, the mom is Justice, who was his love interest from Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, aka Shannon Elizabeth, aka like early two thousands sex symbol because of the American Pie movies. Oh, right, that's where she was the the foreign exchange student. Yeah, yeah, she was she was like the the like ideal image of woman in the American Pie movie. Yeah. Well, teenage girl, right, right. Um, well, I mean, I played by was like yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was produced by the Weinstein. No, the, was American Pie produced by the Weinstein Company? I don't know. I can't remember. Yeah, I'd have to look that up. But um, but um, yeah. So so she has a daughter named Millennium. Um, she's married to a woman played by Rosario Dawson, whose last name is Falcon. So uh, Jason uh, 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 Jay's 
um, daughter that he just discovers. Her name is Millennium Falcon. Um, <laughs> Jane and Bob get really excited about that. Um, but yeah, she uh, she f- forces them at knife point to take her and her friend to uh, what do they call it? Oh, Chronic Con to Chronic Con in Hollywood. In, in Hollywood, yeah. Um, where uh, this sounds absurd. Oh, it's still. Oh, it's already, I just yeah, like put that absurd. out there. Like, what, what's yeah. even? And and the reboot of the the, the Blunt Man v Chronic reboot is being directed by Kevin Smith, who they just keep talking about what a terrible what a terrible director he is and, and making fun of him. Right. Um, but the the there's a pivotal scene that is going to be um, uh, that is going to be I want to say recorded uh, that is going to be uh, spoiled spoiled. <laughs> 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 There's a pivotal scene that's going to be filmed at Chronic Con, so they have to go there um, and try to stop it, and and thereby scuttle the whole uh, the whole movie. Right. Whereas Millennium Falcon and her very millennial friends all want to be an extra in the Blunt Man and Chronic movie, and that becomes an issue later on as as like Jay kind of realizes like he's he's missed the entirety of his his daughter's life standing outside this quick stop selling weed. And the whole time, he's actually, he's not allowed to let her know that he's her dad. Justice, um... The mother. You know, Justice, the mother, um, he, he, he accidentally finds out that he has a daughter, um, and she, she makes him promise not, not to reveal himself as the dad. But here oh he is God. in a car going cross country and holding his back while suddenly, you know, develop, he's, he's confused and he's trying to understand, you know, what does it mean to be a dad and, and can I be this dad? But I, um, act act dadly to I would say fatherly but dadly <laughs> towards her um, am I, you know how how bad of a dad am I um, all while not telling her that he's her dad well and also he oh has God. like there's a whole thing about he never knew his dad and that's right, why right. he's standing outside the quick stop all day right history repeats itself or he doesn't want history to repeat itself really um, right well it's by the way oh well, I don't know it's neither here nor there she, she, she well the entire her. movie is history repeating itself right oh right so this is one more way in which yeah it's a reboot it's a reboot of of, of his life mm. his dad and him so so now um, 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 Millennium Falcon and Jay is a is a reboot of a what, what is that? Cheats. Oh, thank you. Oh, that was from there. I thought you pulled it out of your uh, bowl. So. All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's a reboot of, of his experience with his dad. So, uh, right. wow, so many reboots. Um, but again, the movie is called Reboot. It's, mm. it, it, it wears its on its sleeve. Yeah. That's, that's the lampshade <laughs> hanging. Um, that's the, again, in, in Star Wars The Force Awakens, when there's the new Death Star called Starkiller Base, mm. um, and Han Solo says, oh, so it's like the Death Star, but bigger. Mm. Um, so that's lampshade hanging is when the, the filmmakers know um, that there's something obvious that is just so I don't know, so flawed or so wrong or 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 or, or yeah, we're just repeating it. So, but we're going to tell you because we know this, right? So you can't it, hold us against. It us turns laziness into hipness. Yeah. Or in some case, I mean, in some cases, it's really because I would say like half of Arrested Development, the classic run, the first three seasons, is just like a very long, complicated exercise in lampshade hanging. How so? Every joke becomes self-aware because it's a running joke. Okay. And they're like at a certain point they're referring to the fact that the joke's going to happen. Okay. In the like the, the later seasons of Arrested Development, it, it almost, like, or not the later seasons, there's only three. There's only three that exist. The last two, I mean, they don't exist. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you're, 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 you're blocking them uh, you're out of your mind? Or have you not seen them? I, I saw the fourth one all the way through. Okay. I didn't see the remixed version of it they put out, but I don't, I, I, I gave it, I gave it enough time. The fifth season, there were Parts that were very good, but on the whole, it's it was a concept that belonged to a very specific time and a very specific place and does not... I mean, okay, so they made a couple... I mean, if we want to go into, like, what went wrong with the rest of development, I, I, I could do a whole episode on that. But the, the fourth season, you take away the greatest strength of the show, which is you have a bunch of incredibly talented comic actors. You put them in a room, they snap things back and forth, and it's it's like seeing a lot of very talented people play tennis or something. Um, the fourth season, they couldn't do that, so you just isolate all of these characters, and alone, they're not very interesting 
interesting. Okay. And you you also lose the plotting element where you can't have these incredibly complicated interlocking plots that lead up to a like big fireworks finale. That creates problems. Um, they also insist that the timeline of the show has to pick up exactly where the third season left off. And then in the fifth season, exactly where the fourth season left off, which means that you end up stuck with these plot ideas that would have been very funny in 2006 and now just kind of seem like this weird, like, why why do we care about this right now kind of stuff. Like, the topicality of it is completely ruined. Um, Wait, I just realized as you were saying this, the fourth season was the one where they couldn't get the whole cast together, so they filmed some Yeah, so there's the first three seasons, which were the ones that were on Fox. It gets canceled after the third season is, is half the length of the other two seasons. Fourth season is, like, almost ten years later, Netflix picks it up. Everybody that was on the show has become a famous movie star, so they decide to make, like, here's an episode for each character. Right. You can watch them in any order. And I really admired, like, the risks that Mitchell Hurwitz was willing to take on that, but they didn't pay off. Um, I like the fact that he was challenging the idea like TV shows or things with perfectly even, evenly, even like runtime installments, right? Because like the Netflix one, some of those episodes are like 40 minutes long. Some of them are like less than 20 minutes long. It's all over the place. Um, so I thought that was, so th- that that was the last season. So there's, I didn't realize there was another season. After there that. was another one that came out like two years ago, I believe, um, in two parts. And that was supposed to be the very end. And I mean, it's, or I don't know if it was supposed to be the very end, but uh, what was it? Uh, um, Alicia Shawcott, the the, girl, the woman who played Maybe, she was kind of like, nope, we're done. I'm not coming back. Um, and then Jeffrey Tambor had that whole like issue on Transparent, supposedly had the big meltdown on the Arrested Development set at Jessica Walter. and um, Which, to be fair, like Jeffrey Tambor has made an entire career out of playing like on self wear assholes. <laughs> so, like, I heard about that and I was just like, oh, Gary Shandling had a profound understanding of human nature and saw Jeffrey Tambor for who he was as far back as, like, the Larry Sanders show, right? Because, like, you hear about that and it's like, oh, Hank Kingsley would totally do that. Uh-huh. Um, who's uh, that sidekick on the Larry Sanders show with the mustache. So you're saying um, that Je- Jeffrey Tambor was playing himself? Well, I think they were all playing variations on themselves to an extent because, like, Gary Shandling Larry Sanders, it's almost an anagram. He makes this sitcom, the uh, Shandling makes this sitcom about running a talk show right after he would have, or I think he was actually offered The Tonight Show before it was offered to Jay Leno and he turned it down to make The Larry Sanders Show. Um... Because, like, Shandling was a guest host on when Carson was about to retire, like, way more frequently than Jay Leno was. Well, no, there was the whole thing, the the Jay Leno versus uh, David Letterman. Right, and that's only because Shandling had taken taken himself out of the running to go oh, make this sitcom okay. at HBO. If he would kept himself in the running, we probably, you know, The Tonight Show would have been running with Gary Shandling for, you know, the rest of the 90s to 2000. But I, I think yeah, Shandling was way too creatively restless to do a talk show uh-huh. for that long. Because he seemed like a guy who needed to like reinvent himself because it, it's Gary Shandling's show and Larry Sanders' show are two of the most different shows both created by the same guy I can think of. Uh-huh. Uh, but then, anyway, we, we could talk about... I could talk about Gary Shandling for, like, hours. <laughs> oh, yeah, so so Jane Silent Bob. Yeah, Jane Silent Bob. So, um, um... Yeah, oh, so there's, again, just like in Jane Silent Bob uh, uh, Strike Fact, there's a group of four, uh, four women, although here it's a group of four teenage girls, um, that Jay and Silent Bob go cross-country with to get to mm-hmm. Hollywood. Um, and so Justice was one of the four... Millennium Falcon's mom uh, was one of the four in the first movie so now they've got again four but they're they're younger and more diverse which is explicitly stated in the movie 
multiple times. Saying. Yeah, yeah, the thing. As part of this reboot, we made them younger and more diverse. That's you hilarious. take the original concept, yeah, you make it, yeah, younger and more diverse, which is part of the de- the part of the definition, I think, of of reboot versus remake, um, or, or of just or of either one of them. Um, I, mean, um, I think that's the thing that Smith on. really did right in the movie too, though, is that like he acknowledges the fact that he feels like this man out of time slightly because the social standards have changed. At the same time, it doesn't seem like he's he's doing that like cranky old man like why don't you millennials have a sense of humor or something like he gives a pretty good amount of respect to the millennial characters they're just sort of like he doesn't quite it it, it, it seems like he's acknowledging I don't understand you but you're here and ultimately what's important is relating to you as like my daughter or something as right. opposed to feeling alienated like Archie Bunker by the larger culture right well so they're now the, the millennials are are his daughters, and one of them played by his actual daughter. Right. Um, uh, so so a side note regarding uh um so there was the the the, the fact that they're they're diverse. There's um uh there's uh the one character, Millennium Falcon. Um, she is uh she's white. Oh, uh, they're, they're all women, but she's white. Her friend, but her best is, friend, is like a mute black woman. She's well, she she's deaf. Well, yeah, yeah, or deaf, deaf. Or deaf. Yeah, she's yeah. she's Silent Bob, but she's a young black. Woman. Right, right. And then there is a Syrian refu- a, a Muslim Syrian refugee, um, and there is a uh, Chinese student who speaks very, very softly. Was that a reference to The Ring? Oh, Something shit, like that, that might have been. Yeah. I've, I've never seen The Ring, I'm just trying Me to... Me either. Um, well, you, you, you're the only person here who's seen The Ring. Did yeah, you see The Ring? I don't know. What would that be a reference to exactly? Um, uh, young Asian uh, teen or, or girl um, with jet black dark hair um, who doesn't say anything or speaks very, very, very softly, in, inaudibly. Um, I didn't realize the, the girl in the ring was Asian. She definitely. Oh, maybe had, she's not. Maybe she's not. She but wasn't had the long ring originally made hair. in Korea? Oh, maybe. Or maybe it's a well, remake she was of a, a she was lo- Well, she, the whole, like, she's kind of a ghost creature thing that comes through the TV because she she is like lo- like fell down a well and was there for seven days or whatever. Okay. That's but anyway, it's been years since I saw it. Okay, because because. Because the girl seems like a ghost almost, and, okay, and so maybe, it's really well, creepy. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. It seems like, yeah, it seems accurate then. Because, like, what else would you? Do? She records okay. everything we say because she's creating a podcast to show people <laughs> in China what life's like here in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, what did you think of the the story? The I don't want to repeat the whole story, but the the I can't remember her name, but the the girl that was the Syrian refugee. What did you think of the? about the story, her pretty harrowing experience. I think that's the first time that the movie gets serious, like really serious. Yeah, I I thought honestly given, because like I, I have a lot of faith that like Kevin Smith is a guy who, who is well intentioned. You know, he doesn't really, he doesn't seem like a malicious person. Oh, not at all, not at all. And at, at the same time, I also didn't necessarily like dealing with heavy political subjects that have a high possibility for being like horribly mishandled even by somebody who means well yeah i thought he did a pretty good job like i was expecting way more cringiness as soon as like i heard the phrase younger and more diverse Uh and then saw like oh okay we've got these people dressed up like stereotypical versions of these different ethnicities showing up randomly and like uh, you know, uh, the, the Millennium Falcon's mother has a, has a wife and all that stuff. And I thought he handled it very respectfully when it had enormous potential to go off the rails. So I thought it was a little exploitative. Um, and or maybe um, I just set the bar so low that I was like, <laughs> yeah. it, it it felt almost like the, the detail. Well, some of the detail that I went to um, was um, um, it was not appropriate for this movie. You've got this mm. movie, which is you know full of full of um, cum jokes, right? Um, and suddenly there's the story of her being. I think was she, was she actually was she raped? I, I missed something. Right no, no. So somebody like grabbed her breast, which that's granted, like that's pretty much a euphemism for rape. That is far. That's as close as you could get without spoiling the entire tone of a movie like this. Right. 
And then she says that her brother tried to smother her in her sleep, or because uh, she brought shame on the family. she brought shame on the family. Yeah. And um, so, it, well, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so suddenly we bring in uh, um, uh, in into his movies, we finally bring in um, uh, a character who is uh, uh, Arab and Muslim, and you've just painted um, Islam uh, and and Arabs as 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 being this this horrendous culture mm. um, in which yeah, that, that's what that's what that's what life is like now not to say yes that that it that it, that is very real and it's a yeah, real I mean, experience it happens but at the same time that's the only experience that you're portraying that right. has become problematic but then he also like flings an entire porta potty worth of shit on a KKK meeting I, I guess minutes like, later minutes later which not very subtle but you know, you get the sense that, that he's like, okay. And and I think also the fact that Jay has... The way that Jay's moment of accepting dadhood at the very end, the... What was it, what was it called in the Q&A? The turn or something in the screenplay? Yeah, yeah. Where he's at Comic-Con and Jay has to go decide, like, do I destroy the movie or do I help my daughter get this thing that her friend wants and eat my pride? And... Yeah, but we're talking about two different things. They're both, oh, yeah. they're both sort of the, 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 the serious the serious parts of the movie, mm-hmm. uh, the ones that have a little bit, you know, the, the emotionally laden ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of them is about is about um, uh, the relationship between between parent and child. The other one is painting in, in huge brushstrokes about how you know she's she's a survivor from from uh, with this this very negative stereotype mm-hmm. uh, of of a culture and a religion, and that's mm-hmm. the only the only version that we get of 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 that she's not just a refugee mm. coming to the to the U- she's not just a refugee of war coming to the uh, she's a refugee of the culture that 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 she came from and it's the only it's the only aspect of the culture that we learn about right we don't well, get any throughout the rest of the movie she is like incredibly smart capable like strong like she's kind of she's almost scary in parts of it the same way that like uh, Harley uh, what was Millennium Falcon mm-hmm. is right like because the first time we see Millennium Falcon, she's got like some kind of serial killer mask on or something, and she's like choking somebody out. Um, but the, what, what it, it didn't, I didn't think it added anything to movie other than for Jay to suddenly be a little more serious and realize, hey, there's some real, it, there's some real problems here, it, or mm-hmm. there's people have real issues. Even these 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 teenagers have real issues. Um, or you know, he's making fun of, of of stuff, and suddenly you know, oh wait, he's got a not everything is not everything is funny. Right. Um, it wasn't really about her. It was it was to, to serve showing Jay's seriousness or make him take things seriously. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, and yeah, Grant, yeah. You've, you've got to make fun of, of the KKK. Right. <laughs> uh, well, it just seems like, got to cover well, the KKK. Like he sets up the hater tots joke early on with Fred Armisen. Yeah, that was hilarious. That, that was, was yeah, the hater tot. The, I was just waiting when the guy hands the like super hot tray of tater tots back in the car. I was waiting for just all hell to break loose. Like somebody flips it and they're like covered in birds or something because that's. <laughs> Very. So just to explain this, the hater tots, uh, they, they order, they, they get something from a, from a, a ride sharing service. Um, I forget what it was called. It was, but it was a, uh, a ride sharing service. Um, and Fred Armstrong is the driver that they get. And he, he has a, a little oven, um, in the car and he serves, um, he serves some tater tots and it turns out he, he came up with, uh, he started a business selling tater tots, um, in a box, mm-hmm. uh, like in a cereal box, uh, looking thing, uh, called hater tots. Um, and he had a reason for it and it was marketed to, to, to teenage girls. Right. Um, but he didn't realize that hater tots means different things to different people. So to obviously to the, it, it suddenly became really popular with white nationalists. <laughs> 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 and when they when they that run across the gag. when they run across the Klansmen, the Klan. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, oh I well, that was a great gag. Yeah, it was a great yeah. gag. And then when they run across the Klansmen, the Klansmen actually talk about serving hater tots, so they're they're big fans of it. So. Uh, yeah, but I'm sorry. I just wanted to explain it. Since oh we yeah, brought yeah it up. that was. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I feel like the only characters that are actually developed in any substantial fashion in the film are, are basically Jay and Millennium Falcon. Like, right. And even well, Kevin Smith when he he introduced when he came on stage, and then he introduced Jason Mewes as the star. 
of Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. Which I think he is. And he is, you're right. By far, like far and away, it's his movie. The movie is about Jay and his relationship with his daughter. Right. Silent Bob is his sidekick. Mm. Um, And and then the other girls are are her sidekicks, sort of. You know, they're they're her posse. Um, Or they're they're her group, but that's, uh, you know, that that just... Yeah, the main story, it's it's, Jay is the star and Millen and Falcon is his daughter. Um, and he, re- yeah, at, when he, at, 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 after the show, when they came up for the QA, he referred to him as that again, and and then it made sense. At first, it sounded mm. like it was just sort of self-effacing, um, but then after watching the movie, it's like, yeah, that, that yeah, he really is the star. Jay and, and Malay, yeah, Jay and Harley Quinn Smith are the uh, the stars of the film. Like, yeah, yeah, no question. Right. Yeah, this wasn't as much Jay and Silent Bob though that the the we used to. We did get a lot of that, mm. but it was it was more it. It was it was more serious than 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 that, and it, it wasn't just the the antics of James Bond. Well, it seemed like he'd learned something, right? Because like he he tries to have the same emotional denouement. I, I think that or not the same one, but like the same kind. Of, he, he try he approaches the same emotional or desired emotional tone at like the end of Chasing Amy. He wants it to be this serious thing. He wants to impart some kind of valuable lesson about friendship and you know not judging people. But I think the end of chasing Amy honestly is is kind of terrible. Why is that? Okay, so the, there's this clear, like, yes, there's this triangle of affections between Banky, who the movie keeps trying to paint as having, like, a, a like gay crush on Ben Affleck, which I don't... I feel like it could have been explained just as easily as, like, I'm in a state of arrested development, my friend got a girlfriend, and I'm jealous of the fact that he's spending all this time with his girlfriend without right. having to bring in the sort of, like, well, if he's jealous, clearly he must have the hots for Ben Affleck. Okay, yeah, thing. I agree. I totally didn't buy that. And the, like, and then the way that he tries to resolve it is he brings both people in a room and says, let's have a threesome. Right. Which is, like, what? Where did they come from? <laughs> Um, yeah, but, and, and I think, and granted, I think he was coming, like, Chasing Amy is a movie that is not actually that good, but I, I do give him credit for trying to explore other people's perspectives, and he kind of came into the movie from this sense of, like, oh, man, I just completely fucked up my real-life relationship with Joey Warren Adams by being an idiot, and I'm gonna make a movie to try to make that up to her. At the same time, he hadn't grown up yet. Uh-huh. Um, and th- this film seems like it was it was made by an adult. Maybe it was the first Kevin Smith film that I've seen that seemed like it was made by a person who was actually an adult. Interesting. Like, okay. On the inside. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, you, were you laughing at the comment or were you laughing that, at something else? That's my contribution. <laughs> <laughs> well, your contribution earlier was that you didn't like Chasing Amy much, right? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think it was that great. I mean, well, okay, I'm trying to remember. Like, I like most of the, like, the stuff where they're just BSing. Well, I mean, Clerks is, yeah, Clerks is the best movie. I think that, for my money, it's the best movie he's made ever, period. Like, even if this one shows a lot of growth, and I think he, he should be proud of the movie that he turned in this time, but... Yeah, it was fun. It was a fun movie. I was actually expecting it not to be. Um, I was not expecting to be as good. pure garbage, like from the review, because the reviews online it's got like a forty nine on Metacritic right now. Um, but I think it's higher on. Um, uh, I think Rotten Tomatoes uh, gave it a higher number. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, but and also just like the guy has been, he's had a spotty track record. Like his podcasts are always consistently entertaining, but his movies have not been like a sure bet in a very, very long time. No, but I go see them all sort of in the same way that I go see all the Marvel movies, um, knowing that they're <laughs> that they're not all going to be um, good. Or you go to the DC movies, which are mostly, you know, You know messes. they're going to be bad. Yeah, yeah. With the, right, right. So, you know, and then when Wonder Woman comes out, I'm like, oh my God, this one's good. <laughs> Is it actually good? Wonder Woman? Yeah, yeah. Wonder Woman was actually good. So, uh, I kind of yeah. wanted to see Batman v Superman because it just looked like such a fucking shit show. It, it was, except for the Wonder Woman part. <laughs> 
Oh, wait, did I ever send you the the link to my uh, article about it? Oh, no, I, wrote, no, I, 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 so. I wrote a review, a sort of review uh, of of it, and uh, um, but I call it Batman v Superman: Dawn of Wonder Woman, in which uh, it's it's basically it's a two and a half hour trailer for the upcoming Wonder Woman movie. I said this too, you know, this was this was a year and a half before Wonder Woman came out. So. Right. But the 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 third act is Wonder Woman shows up. You kind of see you see Diana Prince throughout bit mm-hmm. by bit, but you don't know that she's Wonder Woman. Um, and then boom, you know, with a crash, she shows up and she saves the day. She 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 basically saves Batman and Superman's ass. Um, well, doesn't the end of it? It's like a rip off of the end of Dark Knight Returns, where Batman's in like a giant armored suit and he's fighting Superman with like a piece of kryptonite or something. No, that's Batman v Superman. No, fighting with a piece of kryptonite? Well, okay, so the end of Dark Knight Returns a Frank Miller graphic novel. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Batman's okay, in a yeah. giant armored suit, kind of like Iron Bob at the end of Jane's Silent Bob reboot. Yeah. And he has, like, this piece of kryptonite that he bought on the black market, and then he, like, distracts Superman with it, and then he has Green Arrow shoot a kryptonite arrow at Superman to kill him because Superman is the representation of, like, U.S. imperialism or something. Uh-huh. Well, yeah, yeah, and Batman v Superman, he has this 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 kryptonite spear okay so it's yeah spear. so it's it's like taking a, a bunch from it yeah um but yeah yeah no it wasn't a very good movie but i when i said i might have seen it twice now i think about it but yeah i knew i i heard that it wasn't that good but damn it i was gonna go see it anyways because it's another superhero movie and i like batman and i like superman so i want to see them on the big screen <laughs> Um, so in the same way, yeah, I like Kevin Smith. I love Clerks, and I've enjoyed all his movies. And I know, okay, some of these are not that good, but I'm going anyways, and I'm going to go and enjoy them. And I do enjoy them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Red State was probably the hardest one to watch because it was pretty serious. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was it was much more serious than any of his than any of his films. I mean, it was still it was it was it was funny. I mean, there's some yeah. ludicrous things in it, but 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 it makes a much more serious point in the whole um, everything in it. Is I'll use the word again serious <laughs> so what else uh, <laughs> so what else we, Dan? well we've we've not spoiled the movie we've spoiled the movie yeah we didn't spoil we've... the movie nearly as much as we oh oh the the part that i thought was uh a mess well i don't know the mess of the movie it was in the well, okay so yeah ben affleck shows up at the end and he's got a daughter who's small and it's this very emotional moment because we the viewer existing in the real world know that ben affleck and Kevin Smith had this like 15, 20 year falling out uh-huh. and like the fact that they're, you know, and, and Smith, like Smith couldn't stop talking about it at the fucking end of the show. He's like, yeah, I'm best buddies with Batfleck again. I, I I mean this is a serious moment, but I can't stop calling him Batfleck. But <laughs> but no, and, and he gives this long monologue about what it means to be a father, and the way that it's shot. Oh yeah, I, I also have to say this is the most competently shot Kevin Smith film, the, at least that I've seen. Like he didn't get stuck in just sort of doing shot reverse shot over and over and over again, and just sort of using film as this way to dump dialogue in your lab. Um, but yeah, the movie slows to a crawl. Ben Affleck reads an entire page-long monologue that kind of underlines all the points of the movie. About fatherhood. About fatherhood. And I mean, it's not like the worst written speech I've ever heard. And you know, it seems like it's kind of like it, it, Kevin Smith's appeal now is, is weirdly that he's like it's wholesome stoner comedy. You know, you don't <laughs> have to think like this guy secretly racist or something or like this guy right. is like secretly like raping kids or something. Wow. Okay, sorry, go on. Well, no, because, like, think think about it. When we were watching, I mean, technically the, you know, the guy who was funding all those movies to begin with was, like, raping people left and right, because, right. I mean, his entire career was as part of the Weinstein Company up through, like, the early 2000s. Which I think he's he's donating all his, uh, um, any money that he's making uh, off of those, he's donating to some, uh, um, uh, to some charities. Uh, yeah, and I mean, he brought it up in the Q&A, and he was just kind of like, yeah, I mean, he, he kind of, he, I, I thought he handled it fairly well without, like, killing the mood in the room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you recognize that he might have just <laughs> killed the mood in the room, and it's amazing. Right, well, he said something he was worried like, about oh, it. hopefully we can buy back Dogma now that, like, R.B. Weinstein's in the hole, and then he was like, just to be sure that everyone knows, I do not think I am at all the victim in this situation. Yeah, yeah. 
blah, 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 people got hurt, etc. So, he, he, yeah, he, he did a good... And good thing he remembered that, because he was, like, very obviously stoned, and, like, you could tell that he just smoked backstage, because, like, oh, his, voice, so? oh, his was... voice was so rough at the beginning of the oh, okay, screening, yeah. yeah. Um, um, oh, no, I was actually surprised. It's like, wow, he doesn't seem as stoned as I, uh, as I was expecting. Hmm. Um, Tolerance? Yeah, maybe. Maybe <laughs> that's it. So, um, um, but, yeah, I'm saying this all out of out of adoration having listened to having seen all his movies um and listened i, I used to listen regularly to uh three of his podcasts i think oh uh, which one is batman on batman uh no education hollywood babylon um and uh uh what was it called smodcast oh yeah yeah, yeah smodcast yeah. those are the three i only listened i think to one one or two fat men on batman uh episodes i'm really sad that education isn't uh that there, there aren't new episodes there haven't been new episodes Episodes for at least a year. I really oh, enjoyed that. that like, yeah. Oh yeah, and there's um the there's a cameo by Stanley at the end that was like I I felt kind of emotional at that. Even if he yeah. did fuck over Jack Kirby, and I'm never gonna let him live it down. Like it it just sort of I guess it goes <laughs> back to that thing we were talking about in the last episode, aka an hour and a half ago in our lives, but different <laughs> different in your life of just sort of like it, Stanley's voice is one of those kind of Proustian cookies, right? It's like the most instant way to evoke like being a kid watching cartoons. Because he sounds like the, you know, because he would introduce all the Marvel cartoons or something. Like he was the public face of comic books for such a long time. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought it was really, yeah, like the, the footage that he, he threw on at the end. Like it was... It was a crowd pleaser, whatever, but I, I, I liked it. Yeah, and again, there was there was there was Kevin Smith, the fanboy, mm. um, and also knowing that his audience are all fanboys, um, or or so fanboys and fangirls, um, and uh, of of both Kevin Smith and Stanley, probably. There's there's a there's a big uh, 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 crossover uh, there, so I mean, it was definitely an audience pleaser. And yeah, it was yeah, it was I mean, it was a little it was moving. Worked, so. and it, it yeah, it wasn't like maudlin or sentimental. It was mm. it, I thought it it was funny. Yeah, it seemed like it it kind of told us a little bit about how did these two men relate to each other, and it was like very obvious that like Kevin Smith was you know sort of in awe of this guy even yeah, in yeah. his decline phase, and like he he looks like he's about to die in that footage. He looks Stanley. very old. Yeah. Um, oh, and, and this wasn't by, by the way. I know he's talked about this on on, on some of his, of his podcasts. I mean. Stan Lee um, came over to his house uh, I don't know how many times mm. um, but so they actually had a relationship oh yeah because when he uh, he had that elder abuse thing like Kevin Smith put out a thing saying like Stan can move in with us if he needs somebody to take care of him because like his manager stole all that money from him oh really oh yeah the, the, remember when Stan Lee started all those like online flash series including like Backstreet Boys or Superheroes Backstreet Project no no I don't know anything about this oh okay we should watch Watch some of those for the podcast at some point. They're like, yeah, he he kind of he was freed from working exclusively for Marvel Comics sometime in the early two thousands. He did a couple, he did a series of one shots for DC that were what if Stan Lee created the DC universe? So oh, neat. Th those were I remember the beat. They weren't great, but they were fun. And he was able to get some really great artists to work on him. So there's like him and Andy Cooper do Batman's origin story. Him and he does like a different origin story for I think Green Lantern and Wonder Woman and, and there were like five or six of them but he also created this um, StanleyMedia.net and there were he start he create co-created a bunch of like really crude early web shows. Uh, the most well important is relative it is, but <laughs> the best one was the Seventh Portal. The weirdest one was the Backstreet Project, which is Stanley teams up to make the Backstreet Boys into superheroes or something. Uh, there was the Accuser. There was the Drifter, and then there were also like these cartoons of Stanley dressed up as Hannibal Lecter and Silent of the Lambs giving like crazy Stan's soapbox rants which were great uh -huh. um, 
I think it was called the Evil Clone, yeah, because it was supposed to be like Stan Lee's clone that was locked away, saying like, eh, blah, 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 you know, they, they put like little. Wait, so what did this have to do? With, on... You were saying something about his agent and oh, so money? the guy that he co-founded Stan Lee Media with, Paul, um, Paul something or other, uh, basically just screwed him out of like tens of millions of dollars and then tried to run off to South America. Oh wow! Um, and the company, which was actually doing quite well at the time, just folded overnight. Um, all that's really left of any of the intellectual property of that stuff is there's a there's a roller coaster based on Seventh Portal at Universal Studios, I think. But that's yeah, they produced a lot of episodes um, in the short the short lifespan of the website. But so 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 the guy stole all the money, and then Kevin Smith said Stanley can move in with me. If, uh, is that what you're saying? Yeah, because well, because his uh, I, I forget like after his wife died too, because that happened, Stanley's and then he wife. got it, and then his wife died, and then another manager stole a bunch of money, and then there was a lawsuit that went into the works, uh, basically alleging elder abuse against Stanley because he was in his nineties at that point, you know, right? And Kevin wait, wait, wait. Smith put out a public call saying like, if Stan wants to come stay with us in our house, he we're happy to look out for him. Okay. Wow. Wow, that's cool. Well, not all that stuff, but it was cool yeah. on, on Kevin Smith's part to uh, to do that. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Any more thoughts on that? Oh, by the way, I checked. Uh, um, Rotten Tomatoes has, uh, I think it said 79, uh, 72 or 79%, uh, right. percent, but it's only based on 19 uh, critics reviews. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be... I mean, it's also, it's like a critic-proof proof movie. Like, yeah. it, he literally said when he introduced the movie, he's like, who's ready to go back to the 90s? And it, yeah, I yeah. guess I was. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a, the yeah audience score of ninety four percent. So the, I mean, it's, it's a, a crowd it's also, leader, right? Right for the the audience, it's 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 not gonna it's not a very broad audience. The 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 people who are going to watch Kevin Smith's new movies are people who are already Kevin Smith movie fans. Yeah, yeah, the same people that are willing to to go to these special these special screenings, right? Yeah. So all right, like us. So uh, so this has been Dan. Wait, wait, wait. So. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth podcast, pod guest. So do you have anything more to add? Ah, uh, it sounds, sounds like a, a good nostalgia walk down memory lane, even though it, it just happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's what the whole movie is. Yeah. The whole movie is a walk down memory lane. Oh, well, I'm saying the, the rich, you wait, you mean us talking about it now? I or, have or? seen the future no, I and I got experience. deja vu. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which the movie was a walk down memory lane from something that happened 20 years ago. So. Right. Right. Right, so this is our walk down memory lane of a walk down memory lane. So this is, yeah, this is like our collective past reboot. Our collective past reboot. Oh, okay, another thing I need to wrap my head around. <laughs> All right, so, so this has been Dan. And Ron. And the show's called The Nominee, mostly movies, uh, if you're on Twitter. And and uh, that's it. We'll yeah, see we'll, you next time. I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone.